Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I want to start by just introducing uh, really a bit of a background to the theme of my talk to get, uh, today, uh, rethinking mental health care, what the developing world can teach the developed world. Uh, really, the theme was inspired by a tragedy, a tragedy which I think most of you will be familiar with, uh, a tragedy in which 20 young people were killed in a terrible school shooting uh, a few months ago in the US uh, uh, by another young person who ultimately also ended his own life. <clears throat> The tragedy really inspired my thinking because it triggered a, a great debate in the US about the state of mental health care in that very richly resourced country. Uh, and CNN, uh, this particular news site uh, that uh, reported this story, invited me as an expert in global mental health uh, to contribute to this particular debate. This opportunity that I got from CNN to think about uh, access to mental health care uh, was a welcome one because I think this is one of the most neglected issues in public health globally. And I thought, well, let me examine what do we know about access to mental health care in the US to start with. And I discovered something quite startling. This is a, a study that I discovered uh, which reported the 12 month use of mental health services in what is the world's richest country. And it reported a very startling figure. It turns out that of the individuals who participated in the survey, fully 60% of those who had a diagnosable mental disorder in the previous 12 months had not received any kind of health care whatsoever, not just mental health care, but any kind of care of any description for their mental disorder. Now, when people in my particular area of work, biomedical professionals, are confronted with these sorts of figures, our natural response is a predictable one. The problem is that we don't have enough mental health resources. We don't have enough mental health professionals. And therefore, the natural solution that follows from that is we need to invest in training more psychiatrists, more psychologists, and investing more in mental health facilities. But here's the puzzle. The puzzle is that we're talking about the world's most well-resourced mental health resourced country ever. It seems to me that simply thinking of supply of mental health care professionals is not a sufficient explanation to understand why such large numbers of people with mental health conditions do not access or receive care in rich countries. In fact, I think the answer to this problem lies well depicted in this cartoon. It isn't really whether or not we have a bearded man smoking a cigar providing mental health care, but the problem is how and where he or she is providing the care in a manner that is disconnected and removed from the community, from the society in which he operates. Now, I work in a completely different part of the world, mostly in India, but also in several African countries, where in contrast to the US or Western Europe, for example, there are almost no mental health human resources. In one country, Zimbabwe, for example, where I spent a number of years, there were just 10 psychiatrists for a population of 10 million people. So you might wonder, how in heaven's name can such under-resourced countries teach anything to well-resourced countries? Well, I believe that some of the most creative things happen when you are short of resources, when you're forced to think outside the box on how to address major social problems. And I think in the way we are doing that in the developing world might offer perhaps radically new ways of rethinking how mental health care should be organized in the rich world. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about. But first, let me tell you a little bit about, in a summary form, what do we know about mental disorders from a global context? And here, I'm going to be giving you some headline findings of a very large body of research that's been carried out over the last three to four decades. Well, firstly, the numbers are staggering. Even by the most conservative estimate, about 400 million people on our planet today suffer from a mental disorder. Now, some people get very astonished when you, they hear this number. But if you consider that I'm talking about an incredibly diverse range of conditions extending from autism and intellectual disability in childhood through to depression, psychosis, alcohol and drug abuse in adulthood and all the way through dementia 
uh, in old age, then I'm pretty sure that each and every one of us here today knows not just one person, but I think several people, even in our most immediate social networks, who is affected. And suddenly this number actually feels like an underestimate. If we put all mental disorders together into one basket, they account for roughly 10% of the total burden of disease globally. And of all the disorders, depression is right there at the top of the leading health conditions causing the burden of disease alongside such conditions like heart disease and childhood diarrhea. Unexpectedly, suicide is one of the leading causes of death in young people. A large study we just completed in India found that suicide now kills twice as number of Indians as HIV AIDS does and kills as many young women in India as maternal mortality does. And I take HIV AIDS and maternal mortality only because these are, of course, acknowledged global health priorities. We now also know that there is a vicious cycle between social disadvantage that expresses itself in many different ways. For example, belonging to a minority group, being uh, unemployed, uh, being simply poor in a society. How social disadvantage accelerates the risk of developing a mental disorder, and due to a variety of reasons, for example, a lack of opportunities for employment and the cost of healthcare, because most mental healthcare in the developing world is private out-of-pocket healthcare, the costs of mental healthcare further fuel the slide into poverty, a vicious cycle. And in spite of all this evidence, up to 90% of people with mental disorders in the developing world do not receive the care that we know can radically transform the quality of their lives. India is a country with 1.2 billion people. Let's for a moment imagine a situation in which the number of psychiatrists in India is equal to the number of psychiatrists in Britain according to the ratio to the population. So for example, if we've got X number of psychiatrists to the population of Britain and we translated that ratio to the population of India, 1.2 billion people, we would expect roughly 150,000 psychiatrists in India. Just out of interest, in Britain we have about uh, 30,000. Now, the true number is actually a minuscule fraction of that, just 3,000. What does this particular set of numbers tell us? It tells us that any model of mental health care in India, and mind you, India is one of the best resourced countries in the developing world, any model of mental health care in India that seeks to replicate or mimic a model that has been used in Western Europe is doomed right from the outset because we simply do not have now, nor will we have for the next, for the foreseeable future, the numbers of psychiatrists that are comparable to the numbers that are available in this country. I was very inspired by the innovations that I began to see that were happening around me in countries in Africa and South Asia uh, of other health innovators who were redefining who a healthcare provider was. They were redefining the healthcare provider by including women such as this one in this image on the right hand side. This woman's name is Anjana. Uh, she is what we might call a community health worker. She works in one of the poorest districts of India, in central India. She has not passed school. She can barely read or write. She represents the typical woman in her community. But she's doing something pretty atypical here. She has been trained to diagnose and treat newborn pneumonia, the leading cause of newborn death in the world today. She's also been trained to do a number of other things, but the most important thing she does is save newborn lives. Now, this idea of using women like Anjana <coughs> was really championed by an NGO in central India. Now, they weren't really trying to compete with the neonatologists. They were really trying to fill a gap because there were no neonatologists in these villages where Anjana lived. So they figured, if we can't get neonatologists to come and live and work in these villages, we may as well train whoever's available in these villages to save lives in whatever way we possibly can. But they were also pretty pragmatic. They recognized that if they did this, but didn't prove that this was safe and effective, they would not get acceptability from the professional community and most importantly from government. So what they did was they carried out what is considered in medicine the highest quality of scientific ex experiment of all, a randomized controlled trial. They randomly allocated villages in central India to receive women like Anjana uh, or to simply receive usual care. And what they found is that in those villages where women like Anjana worked, neonatal mortality, newborn deaths reduced by 40% compared to the comparison villages. This experiment was then replicated in a number of sites in India, and today there are a million, one million women like Anjana who are sponsored by the national government to deliver this model of care across the country. <laughs> 
This, to me, is an incredible inspiration. It has completely redefined who can provide child, child health care in one of the poorest countries of the world. And I was very inspired by these models of care. These models of care now go back two decades, really. Uh, and I thought, well, if you can train women like Anjana to save a newborn life, why not train women like her to treat mental illness? And the good news is that in the last decade, the science of task sharing, the idea that you can share mental health care tasks to non-mental health care providers, effectively redefining who a mental health care provider is, has been growing by leaps and bounds. Let me share some great examples with you. And I'm going to start with three randomized controlled trials. If you remember, these are the experiments, the holy grail of medicine, the experiments that define the highest quality, quality evidence that medicine considers uh, uh, for deciding what's effective or not. Here are three different experiments in task sharing for the treatment of depression in three different parts of the world. The first experiment was carried out by Paul Bolton and his colleagues in southern Uganda, where there was a raging HIV epidemic. They trained ordinary people in villages to deliver a psychological treatment called interpersonal therapy and compared the prevalence of depression in those villages where you had trained health workers with villages in which there were none. And what did they find? In those villages with the trained health workers, the lay health workers, 95% of people with depression recovered compared to just 45% in the comparison villages. A staggering difference. Atif Rahman and his colleagues worked in rural Pakistan working with mothers who were depressed. What do they do? They took lady health visitors, and these are the routine community health workers who work in Pakistan's maternal health care system, trained them to provide cognitive behavior therapy to mothers who were depressed. And again, as Paul Bolton did, uh, compared two different sets of settings, uh, villages where these trained workers were available with those in which they were not trained, and again reported a dramatic increase in recovery rates from maternal depression, 73% in the intervention villages compared to 40%. And our own trial in India, where we used a lay health worker, placed them in primary health centers, gave them a very low-intensity psychological intervention, uh, which also included adherence support for those who were receiving antidepressants. And we placed them in primary health centers and compared what were the outcomes of people for depression and anxiety um, in those clinics compared to those uh, without access to these case managers. And again, we found an important difference of 70% versus 50%. What are, the ex what are the lessons we can learn in order to design successful mental health care programs that rely on the use of community workers or lay health workers as frontline providers? And I've coined this acronym, SUNDAR, which, which really, in my mind, captures five key essential components of an effective task sharing program. The first is we need to simplify the message by stripping away the jargon that psychiatry and its allied disciplines loves to surround itself in. We need to unpack the very complex treatments that we have developed and which are very effective, complex psychological treatments, for example, into smaller pieces, smaller components that can be more effectively delivered by whoever is affordable and available in the local community and delivered where people are. So rather than expecting people with mental health conditions to come to clinics, actually delivering these intervention, interventions where they want them to be delivered, even if it means in their own homes. And to reallocate that very scarce and expensive resource of specialists to perform other tasks, such as training and supervision. Now, many people get very concerned by this idea of task sharing. There are a number of different concerns, and I've summarized the three that I've frequently heard whenever I've talked about this idea, uh, especially to professional audiences. The first is that somehow this dismisses the role of specialists. Actually, nothing can be further from the truth than that. In all these experiments, specialists play a critically important role. But their role is different from the one that we have imagined previously. They move from becoming frontline providers of mental health care to becoming people who manage programs of care that are primarily intended to reduce the treatment gaps and improve access to care. The second critique is that it dumbs down mental health care. Far from it. Actually, as you've seen from all these particular stories, that these are all high-quality experiments. These are medical or public health experiments in which we are very concerned with ensuring the safety and the effectiveness of these models of care. What it does is it expands the range of interventions to achieve a larger coverage of care as opposed to what we currently have. And finally, it's 
politically subversive. This I have no problem with at all, because I think that's what really these ideas are meant to be. But I think it's also the practical avatar of the idea that mental health care, and indeed all health care, is far too important to be left to professionals alone. So say you've got somebody um, suffering from you know, a severe episode of depression. Um, what sort of thing would, would be being offered to them um, by, by these you know, sort of local providers? So that's a great question because actually that, that feeds directly into uh, the program that I'm currently leading. Mm. We're working uh, in, in India on a program to train community health workers based in primary health centers to treat severe depression. And the treatment that we've developed over the last two and a half years, and we're about to start trialing it, includes three broad components. The first is problem solving, a very practical problem solving approach to the social problems that mm -hmm. people actually have. And I think it's important to remember that in most parts of the world, social workers don't exist. Yeah. And so our approach to mental health care needs to combine a more specific technical approach to treat the illness with the s addressing the social issues that almost always coexist with the illness. So for example, domestic violence uh, being a particularly important problem for women. The second important approach is what we call behavioral activation in the technical sense. Simply that means getting people to think about rewarding activities that they have stopped doing because they're depressed and getting them to actually re-engage with those activities. Um, and the third is very much linked to a particular phenomenon that's very contextually important in, in our population, which is rumination. It's a feature of depression, which is um, it's a crippling feature, really. It's a cognitive feature in which a person uh, thinks a lot about their problems. About it's not the same as worrying. It's mm -hmm. almost a, it's it's a, it's it's almost a crippling thinking problem that is associated with depression. And so we teach people techniques, cognitive techniques, on how to be able to address rumination and, as it were, get on with their life. Right. And I was also really interested in. Um, you know, the educational aspects of it, basically, and, and what impact that has on stigma. I know you talked about stigma as being um, a major and worldwide mm. problem connected to mental health. Um, I would imagine that this programme of going into villages, seeing as it so often stems from kind of ignorance, discrimination, ignorance and, and, and uh, misunderstanding, have you had sort of feedback about the levels of stigma reduction or...? I mean, it's a very difficult thing to measure, I acknowledge. It is, yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think stigma is a complex story. Uh, mm. I'm not so sure there is a direct link between... Um, I, I don't, I, I'm not familiar with any evidence that can really draw a direct link between the level of development of a society and stigma. Mm. But my, my observations, as unscientific as they might be on this topic, um, suggest that actually there is less stigma in poorer, more rural economies than one would have predicted. In fact, I think there's more hiding, the richer you are, at least in the Indian context. The more you have to lose, the more you are likely to hide. Um, and and that's, a, that's a very a non-empirical observation. Um, I, I, I certainly have gone uh, to many rural areas, and it's quite spectacular. When I, uh, We've got a big rural mental health care program which is being run in central India. We go to the villages and have community meetings, and also I take part in clinics. And uh, I, I had this wonderful memory of uh, sitting in, in a room just like this, but except everyone sat on the ground, and it was in a village community hall. And uh, um, so, you know, we were introducing this program, and we were exactly worried, about, as you are, you know, how do we introduce this mental health program in a place where there's never been a mental health service? Are people mm -hmm. just going to you know, react and say, no, we don't have problems or mm -hmm. whatever. And I was astonished after I finished giving my spiel, um, suddenly somebody put up their hand and said, um, well, you know, I have a son who wandered off into the forest, uh, you know, a few weeks ago and reappeared a couple of days ago talking complete nonsense. Um, can I please bring him? And this was, this was in a room just like this. Uh, and I was, I was not expecting that. I thought, well, no, actually, this is not a clinic. But then I realized that, um, well, if I said no, I'd lose my first customer, as it were. So I said, sure, but maybe after the meeting's over. And then within seconds, somebody else got up and said, excuse me, but you know, my wife hasn't been getting out of bed. Uh, you know, can, you, can you please come over and see her? And it was astonishing. It completely taught a lesson to me about stigma and disclosure, because clearly no one in this room seemed to be embarrassed to mm. talk about a very personal private hell that they'd lived through. I'm sure you'd like to join me in thanking um, Thank Vikram Patel. Thanks. Thank you.